everybody. It's um, President's Day today, so I have a lot of time. I'm going to put a few videos out today just to get caught up because there's some topics I wanted to go over. So what they don't tell you about your 50s. So if you're still in your 40s or your mid-30s and you're like, oh, 50s are so far away. Well, the first thing is it comes up before you know it. Um, so, uh, sorry, I'm looking around the room because I'm seeing things go around me. I, I'm going to do a video about that too. Um, um, so in your 50s. So when you're in your um, mid 40s to late 40s and you're looking at 50 down the barrel, there it comes. I swear, I and I've talked to my friends about this, something about turning 50, it, it's, it's a big change. My body at 50 went through some things I didn't have all through my 40s. And you know, going through menopause, for example, the American average for going through menopause is age 50 in America. Now, that means some can go at 45, some can start at 55. Um, and then of course, the perimenopausal years are usually after age 35, with most women experiencing it in their 40s. Um, and then you hit age 50. It was like hitting the wall. <laughs> My, yeah. Um, I mean, the one good thing about hitting menopause is I don't have to worry about buying certain products every month and wearing certain color clothes or being caught unawares and I'm not prepared. I don't have to worry about that anymore. So that's kind of nice. But the other door that closes is, um, you know, you no longer can have your own children anymore. I mean, you can certainly adopt and thank you for being here. Okay, so I, okay, let me just backtrack. So my video has a certain amount of resolutions. I'm using an Apple Mac and it has really, really good resolution. And um, as I'm talking, I have orbs around me because I prayed for some of my, uh, my father, my mother-in-law, my um, good spirits of light only with God for the greatest good. So I put good content out there. And today I am seeing them around me, and I can I can see it on the um, on my resolution. But I've noticed on my other videos the ones that I see you can't see. So someday when the YouTube resolution is better, you can go back to these videos and see them. But I archive them and I keep them just in case I can release them. But anyway, sorry I went off topic. Well, so anyway, um, yeah. So the door closes on having your own children. So that's kind of interesting. But the other thing they don't tell you is everything starts to change in your body. You start gaining weight around your middle that was never there before. Um, your joints start to not act like they used to. I mean, my first bout of frozen shoulder, um, I can only lift my shoulder this high, and this one I can lift uh, that way. I I've never had that before in my life. I did read that COVID-19 can cause frozen shoulder because there's um, a multitude of ACE2 receptors in the shoulder joint. I've had COVID twice, and um, after I had COVID twice is when my frozen shoulder began. There was no injury or nothing that would have prompted um, anything for that to happen. So that's interesting. I have had women tell me, however, if they're driving in their car and they just lean their arm back to grab their purse, they felt something and then they ended up getting frozen shoulder. Frozen shoulder is another term for adhesive capsulitis. So you could have a fall, an injury, a tear, and in the process of the injury, you'll have the pain phase where, oh gosh, my shoulder really aches. And when that happened to me, uh, I am a natural minded doctor, but when that happened, I was using um, over the counter Voltaren, uh, which was great, it used to be by prescription. Um, and I am not a medicine taker, but I was taking Advil just because the pain was not fun. And then um, after you go through the painful phase, you go through the frozen phase where it's like, you can't lift your arm up all the way, it's frozen. And then supposedly about a year later, which I'm coming up on this spring, summer, you're supposed to have the thaw phase where you go back to normal range of motion. You know, they recommend physical therapy for that to kind of really stretch out the joints. One of the things I do is like, I'll climb my fingers up the wall, like if I'm in the shower where it got hot water on it so I can force it to kind of stretch without re-injuring it. And there's some great exercises that can help with that. 
And um, so again, another fun thing in your 50s. Also, your dental hygiene changes. I swear to God, it used to be before my 50s, I could eat food, not need a napkin, look in the mirror, and I'm like, okay, no food in my teeth, nothing. Something about my 50s, I guess my mouth is so much drier, I don't know. I constantly get food in my teeth now. I find there's, <laughs> I have to use a napkin now where I used to be able to keep everything inside my mouth, which is really weird. And, you know, of course, for a good jawline and to reduce double chin, you're supposed to chew with your mouth closed. You're supposed to maintain good posture. You can do tongue exercises where you're pushing your tongue up against the roof of your mouth or your soft palate. And then you can kind of gently suck the air in. Notice, I'll do a profile so you can see. And anyway, so that keeps your, uh, your jaw toned. Which again, never had to do that. So now I'm doing these exercises. So I'm going to show you profile and then when I go, see how that lifts up. Um, so it's just another thing to be mindful of is you start to lose tone in the face. So yeah, I mean, it's a natural part of aging. I mean, some people, they kind of age in their lower face and everything just starts to drop and lose tone. Other people, they maintain the tone, but they just get a lot of wrinkles all over. You know, people age differently. So um, I, I do caution, if, if you are a smoker, please try to quit. But if, if you're not at the point where you can quit, take as much vitamin C as you're, at, and you can talk to your doctor about this, of course, um, because I don't want this to contraindicate any medication you might be on or whatnot. But um, vitamin C to bowel tolerance. And what that means is if you take vitamin C, and then say you take, I don't know, I like the emergency packet. Say you get up to 3,000 to 4,000 milligrams and then you start getting stomach upset or gas or diarrhea, like you've reached your bowel tolerance and then maybe you can come down 500 to 1,000 milligrams. So because you need vitamin C to protect your cells if you're a smoker. But if you're a recovering smoker, it's still a great idea to take vitamin C every day and of course antioxidants. You want to maintain healthy cells and help your body repair from cellular damage and that's what uh, antioxidants are doing. So I'm on the rule of five way of eating right now because again like I said you start gaining weight around your middle and everything you used to do before doesn't work anymore. So if you're still in your 30s and 40s now is the time to get on a healthy eating plan and to walk every day and just get used to being active and don't think, oh, I'll do it next year or I'll, I'll do it when I retire. I'll do it when I, no, start in your 30s and 40s because if you enter your, enter your 50s at a healthy weight, you're not gonna have as many of the problems that are going to come for you all in your 50s. Now I can only speak to the changes happening in my 50s. I would love to hear from you in your 60s, 70s, 80s what you're experiencing when you hit, once you hit those milestones. I'm noticing I never had issues with pain. Now I deal with pain. So whether it's lower back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, digestive pain, like, yeah. Another thing that happens is gallbladder issues. So for me, like I'm doing the rule of five diet, I'm avoiding sugar, but I'm allowed to have low carb foods that are high in fiber. And I talk about this on my other videos. You can just watch those, but, um, and then you can have fat. Well, when you lose weight pretty efficiently avoiding sugar because your body goes into ketosis, your gallbladder really takes a hit when it's losing fat quickly. And a lot of people will end up with cholecystitis. They need their gallbladder taken out. That's why I'm saying it's best to lose weight when you're younger and you don't already have, like me, a 50 plus year old gallbladder. Now when I'm trying to lose weight and excess fat, my gallbladder is not what it was 20 years ago. So it's just advice for you in your 30s and 40s that no one has probably told you about entering your 50s. And it's kind of a way of planning for retirement. If you change your habits, and even if you're in your 50s or older, if you change your habits, it's almost like depositing money in the bank. You're making your body healthier so when you arrive at an older age, you're not dealing with all these excess things that make everything worse. So another thing I'm gonna to touch on is dental health. So again, once I hit my 50s, besides the things I was talking about, like drier mouth, and I do think that's um, related to a change in estrogen because you do get dry eyes, a drier mouth, dry throat. I've experienced it and I've had other patients experience it. 
Sometimes um, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy is very helpful. Um, progesterone does tend to help with dry eye and um, as well as estrogen. And um, so, however, you know, if you have a history of breast cancer in your family, like I do, um, I have to be very careful with hormone replacement therapy. But um, yeah, so the other dental changes are having more dental pain, dental infection. So in my lifetime, I've only had to have one root canal. Well, now I, I have a tooth over here that just, just, you know, went bad. I had a crown put on it. And then the crown has cracked and fallen off three different times, which is a very expensive <laughs> procedure to have that constantly replaced. So now my dentist was going to re-put the crown on it. And I said, no, here's the tooth All right here. I said, no, I'm going to wear a temporary till I decide what to do. It's called a flipper. It's like a retainer with this tooth attached. It's a pain because I can't really chew well with it because when you chew foods, it kind of dislodges it and makes it to come out. And I still have half my tooth left, so I have to decide whether to recrown it or get it pulled. That being said, <laughs> speaking of all the dental fun you have to look forward to, um, two of my bottom teeth, and you see it on my videos, I had to have two, uh, my last two teeth down here extracted because they both needed root canals. And I was like, well, I'm not going to have a root canal and root canals can fail or you need to have them replaced in 10 years. And I was like, just pull them out because the amount of fatigue and I was getting sick a lot because I had two teeth that needed a root canal. I tell you what, as soon as I had those removed and it healed, I did have a, um, I did have a bone graft. As soon as that resolved, I got my energy back. Um, I don't know, everything felt different. My neck and my muscles weren't as stiff and sore. I really think my immune system got a boost having those taken out. Because if you have poor teeth or dental care, your immune system is gonna take a hit. You're gonna be more likely to get other chronic diseases such as heart disease and heart infections as well. And I do believe, being in practice this long, that risk of cancers and other chronic diseases goes up when your immune system is constantly trying to put out the fire of gum infections and tooth disease. And that's another thing that you can avoid if you start flossing now, you're brushing regularly, you know, morning and night, after meals, keep a little toothbrush and a little tube of toothpaste in your purse, rinsing your mouth after meals, flossing as much as you can. You can avoid these expensive procedures because I don't think there's one person well, maybe there's one person, my husband. My husband has never had a cavity. He's in his 50s. He has never had a cavity. I think he's an anomaly. So I'm going to say 90% of you are probably looking to a future of expensive dental procedures that no one is telling you about now. And I, I always did. I had braces. I brushed my teeth. I had dental floss. I always did that. I think in my case... There was a little bit of genetics involved. I tend to have more acidity. I'm a more acidic person. Of course, I'm insulin resistance, elevated blood sugar. It tends to create a very acidic environment. So, and I know my husband has a more alkalinic environment. So, okay, I, you know, please, you know, add to the comments, you know, things that you hit the wall on your 50s and everything changed. Oh, hair too, hair loss. Hence why I have all those videos about hair loss. Okay. But I will end this um, in saying that the wonderful gifts of being in your 50s is you kind of reach a place in your career or your family life and even yourself where you're finally confident about the choices you made, whether good or bad, you know, confident about where you are as a person now because everything you went through before makes you the person you are today. And if you've made some bad choices, your 50s are a time to forgive yourself and to allow yourself to move on and maybe atone for some of those transgressions. Maybe do little kindnesses for people as much as you can each day to atone for maybe the past when you know you did people wrong or you were a negative person. But if that's not your issue and you're positive and you make good choices, the 50s are your time to look around and be like, Okay, I'm doing pretty good. I'm still working. I've got things figured out. I reached a lot of my goals. And now we're looking towards the future. What are our 60s, 70s, and 80s, and hopefully 90s and 100s going to look like? The 50s are a time, at least I think, where you're really looking 
at what's your life going to be like in your older age and what are you getting ready to do that? I know I have amped up um, my retirement uh, goals. So in fact, I did take a job at a school because, you know, I do have a private practice and I see patients. That's my main form of income. But I took a job at a school because I thought my son would be there and be fun to work at the school. Long story short, I didn't realize that working for the school would provide the best health insurance benefits and a pension. I guess I didn't realize that when I went to work there, it was like, oh, I've got time. It'll be fun. I'll do part time. I'll help out. Well, they offered me full time. And um, it's been great because I didn't start that until my very late 40s, and now I have a pension. So, you know, it's not the worst idea if you're sitting in your late 40s or mid 40s right now and you're you're looking at your 50s, you still have many years of work ahead of you. It's not the worst idea to work for a nonprofit organization like the school system. We are in dire need of quality teachers and staff. And I know that you see things on all the time about kids have changed and schools are so dangerous to work in. If you make connections and relationships with kids and they know you're there for the right reason, I would say 99% of the time, it's a great place to work. Yes, there are the 1% days where, you know, you might be dealing with a student yelling in your face, using profanity, um, getting in fights. You know. I look at that, I don't take it personal, I look at that like what kind of pain is that person in? Obviously they don't have a strong support system at home. You know, kids for the most part do want to be good and they want to succeed in life and all that, but if they have a lot of personal pain at home and no guidance and no parent support and no no parenting, um, it is forming chaos in our schools, but to me, Instead of abandoning our schools, I know teachers are resigning in droves. You know what that's going to lead to is all online school. We just need more quality people, whether you want to volunteer, come work at a school or whatever, or you've been thinking about working for the school. I mean, the positive thing is great benefits, great insurance, and a pension. I live in the Southwest. That's still how it is here. I don't know about the rest of the country, but you want to start looking towards your future and laying out retirement. Because where Social Security is going, I don't know if I'll ever get Social Security. It may already be bankrupt by the time I reach the age of 62 where I can start claiming it. Of course, the longer you push that off, your annual monthly would go up. So it'd be better to work until age 65 or age 70 if you can. But if you can't and you're physically taking a hit, you can retire at 62. But you want multiple streams of income coming in. And if you're still in your 40s and 50s, really be seriously looking at that now. It gives you so much peace of mind. I don't stress out and worry as much. Even though I plan on working in my practice until I, I have to be like wheeled out with a wheelbarrow and can't do it anymore. Um, but it still doesn't allow me to, for example, help my kids out, help put them through college, um, you know, deal with emergencies and, and um, finances need to be done. I, I'm not on a fixed income. I don't live like in a month to month income. That wasn't always the case in my 20s. Of course, I was living paycheck to paycheck in my 20s. But, you know, you reach your 50s, hopefully you're out of that. And if you're not out of that, you can research videos online on how to get yourself out of that. But I think working for the school system, if your heart's in the right place um, and you really have a heart to help kids, it's a great place to go to help your security for the future and also to change some lives around the way. Oh my gosh, I went on a total rant about being in your 50s and I have so much more to say, but I'd really like to see your comments on it. And that's it for this topic. Thanks for being here. I'll see you on the next one.